Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, good morning. Our uh, text reflection for reflection today is uh, from John's Gospel, the first chapter, which I just read among you. Have you ever noticed that when you are knowledgeable about a subject, that it can be pretty difficult to explain that subject to someone who knows nothing or next to nothing about it. Professional people, uh, especially doctors and lawyers, I think, are put into this position all the time. Uh, they deal in fields that can be very complex and technical and are regularly put into the position of having to explain the intricacies of medicine or law to patients and clients. Another example is the IT guy at your office. <laughs> All you want to know is how to get your document to print, uh, but he's all about routers and servers and networks, uh, important stuff to be sure, but which can come across to you as gobbledygook uh, if you're not as well versed in the field. Now I was reading a new book this week called Even a Geek Can Speak. It's a really nice little book. Um, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a book intended to help people who are experts in complicated disciplines to explain complex ideas to the average person or the non-specialist. Every field has its own uh, specialized vocabulary or jargon. Whether you are a mechanic, an engineer, a gardener, a salesman, a musician, or a brain surgeon, you converse daily almost in your own language. Another area is sports. If you are not um, a, a sports aficionado, it can be confusing to listen to people talk about blitzes, offsides, pinch hitters, stolen bases, and strike zones. Religion is no different. The Bible and Christian books and uh, Christian ministers are filled with terms and concepts that are basically a foreign language to the general person. And the culture in which we live today is, uh, no longer includes daily Bible readings in school uh, for school children. It's no longer possible to speak about atonement, sanctification, or propitiation to the average folks without providing background and explanations. Jargon and specialized vocabulary are not bad. They are necessary. But the doctor, for instance, that is not able to translate the results of a blood test into language that his patient can understand runs the risk of being misunderstood. The same is true for lawyers, auto mechanics, sportscasters, real estate agents, and pastors. The church today must be able to express the teachings of Scripture faithfully, uh, without compromise, without uh, change. I'm not talking about shifting with the wind and, and uh, being wishy-washy, but I am talking about learning how to be clear and how to be understood by the people to whom we speak. If I were to be a missionary in China, it would be foolish for me to speak only English. I would need to learn the native tongue to be able to contextualize and, and bring the gospel message to people. Now even though the people around us don't literally speak a different language, Christianese can almost be a foreign dialect. Now this book that I was telling you about, uh, Even a Geek Can Speak, makes the point that in order to communicate, uh, you've got to answer this question for people. What's in it for me? Now, people will listen to your explanations if you can show them how they or people that they care about will benefit. In today's Gospel lesson from John chapter 1, John the Baptist, um, in, the, in the passage that I read, twice makes a very profound statement about the identity and the work of Jesus Christ. He pointed to him and said, Behold, there goes the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. And uh, two of John's own disciples who heard this uh, left him and went to follow Jesus. Now that phrase, Lamb of God, 
You've heard it, so maybe it is a familiar term. But I think that it is one of those uh, uh, terms that requires unfolding, unpacking. Because John's obviously not being literal. Uh, Jesus was not literally a young sheep. Uh, Jesus didn't have wool instead of hair. For us in the 21st century, this, uh, in America, this phrase, Lamb of God, doesn't have a whole lot of first-hand context. We don't, I mean, I've, I've never, other than at a petting zoo in a major zoo, I've never seen or touched a sheep. But for the first century Jewish person living in or around Jerusalem and those who were listening to John the Baptist, it would have made a lot of sense. They would have gotten it in ways that I don't think we do immediately. Now here is something about uh, the, the culture in which the Bible was written that you've got to know in order to understand what this statement means and how it applies in our lives. See, in Jerusalem at the time, there was a beautiful temple. It was a beautiful uh, complex of porticos and porches and structures, and it was the heart of Jewish worship. When God gave uh, instructions to the people of Israel in the Old Testament on how to worship, He said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but God basically told them, I want you to build a temple in Jerusalem, and I want you to take animals into the temple every single day, very small animals like doves, and great big animals like bulls, and slaughter them there. Uh, to me, take their blood and pour it all over the sides of the altar, and take some of the blood and sprinkle it on the people. This is what I require of you. Uh, to which my first response is, yuck. <laughs> what if we were to do that today? I'm kind of glad that um, Animal Sacrifice 101 was not a required course at the seminary. The idea of animal sacrifice as an act of worship to God seems very primitive to us and even barbaric. I wonder if PETA, uh, the people for ethical treatment of animals, had a Jerusalem chapter in 1000 B.C. I doubt it. If so, uh, they definitely would have staged demonstrations outside the temple. But God's ways are not our ways. And His thoughts are not our thoughts. In today's world, uh, we often do not realize, I think, the seriousness of sin. Many people make light of sin saying, well, God will forgive me. That's His job. With this attitude, I can do whatever I want because I imagine God will just simply forgive. But I don't think that's taking sin seriously enough. God established the temple in Jerusalem with animal sacrifices in Israel in order to teach His people the gravity of their sins. For you see, for every sin you commit, someone or something has got to die. Every sin has an earthly consequence and a heavenly consequence. The earthly consequence can uh, range from minor inconveniences to major suffering. You know, if you steal, you might go to jail. If you lie, you might get caught in your lies and be embarrassed. If you are selfish, you might hurt your relationships. If you do something wrong at work, you might lose your job. These are all unpleasant consequences, earthly consequences for the things we do wrong. But most of the time, we can endure these earthly penalties and life goes on. But when we break a command of God, no matter how large or small, and here's really um, the sobering reality, God condemns us to die. St. Paul uh, tells us that the wages of sin is death. And you remember the story of Adam and Eve. Uh, in the day you eat that fruit, you will die. See, God is so... We're, we're, we're kind of accustomed to Jesus as our buddy. And we fail to kind of recognize the other side of the coin. And that is that God is so utterly pure and perfect and devoid of evil that He cannot and does not tolerate it in His presence. You know, many people, uh, former generations understood this, I think, better than we do. Many people love the song, Amazing Grace. How many times do you think you've sung that in your lifetime? Amazing Grace. The first line goes, and, and please, say it aloud with me. The first line, we'll just speak it together. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a great guy like me. <laughs> right? That doesn't say great guy. It says wretch. I recently heard that there are some who've uh, rewritten that first line because it sounds a bit harsh. A wretch like me has been changed to someone like me or a soul like me. Are we really even amazed at God's grace anymore? Or do we just take it for granted? Has the self-esteem movement made it more difficult for us to grasp the significance of what God has done for us? See, it's not so amazing for God to forgive a pretty good person. Anyone can do that. It is only amazing that he forgives the wretches among us. John Newton, who wrote that hymn a couple of centuries ago, I think understood God's grace better than many modern folk. See, we tend to look at our sins and rate them on a scale of 1 to 10. And um, when you, if you compare yourself to pretty much anyone around you, you probably unconsciously give yourself a handicap, don't you? Uh, murder on that scale would definitely be a 10. But gossip, maybe only a two or three. What ranking would you give the sin of ingratitude? Or how about disrespecting authority or pride? Yes, in terms of the earthly consequences, our sins have varying degrees of severity. Not every sin uh, is a death penalty in the earthly sphere. But God does not grade on a curve. I often ask people, um, you know, that according to Scripture, uh, do you think that God expects us to be perfect or just to try our hardest? Now, most people get the answer wrong. It's uh, Jesus told his followers, um, you know, uh, be perfect. Literally, that's what he said. I'm quoting, be perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Now, where's the ambiguity in that? Where are the shades of gray in be perfect? We are either perfect in God's eyes or we're not, and we are not, not one of us, not me, certainly. Only Jesus Christ was perfect and sinless and without any flaw. See, this try your hardest business uh, almost sounds appealing in a way, but it's a slippery slope because has anyone in this room ever really tried his hardest to follow God's laws? Really? Can't you try just a little harder? Do just a little more? Because Jesus didn't say be pretty good or be relatively good. He said be perfect. And I find that to be one of the most um, eye-opening sentences in the whole Bible. It says in the New Testament book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. See, our salvation is so costly that something or someone has to die to pay for it. Either we or a substitute. Now the Old Testament priests were told by God to offer two spotless lambs on their altar every single day for the sins of the people. One in the morning and one in the evening. But of course, you know, lambs can't really atone for the sins of, uh, of us. So it had to be repeated every single day. And the reason we no longer have to do this bloody sacrifice, slaughtering animals every day, is because Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He became the final sacrifice once for all. And that's what John the Baptist meant. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as the song says, We are the world. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes understanding keep your hearts and minds in true faith unto life everlasting. Amen.